The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to everyone who's joined us for a very special webinar on the new focused and aligned hierarchical system for the Marzano evaluation models. My name is Jeff Sahaki. I'm with LSI, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's panel. I'm pleased to welcome our presenters, Dr. Beverly Carbaugh and Dr. Robert J. Marzano, whom you'll both be hearing from in just a moment, after we cover a few quick housekeeping items. So before we get started, just a few helpful reminders. Your audio lines will be muted for the duration of the presentation, so please submit your questions and your comments using the GoToWebinar question pane located on your screen. We'll have additional staff on hand to also help answer and direct those questions to the panel, so please keep them coming. And we'll be sure to reserve time at the end of the panel for the Q&A as it's been submitted. So please stay tuned for that. We'll also be recording today's session. So we'll be able to archive everything that we're learning today and share this uh, you know, out afterwards. So you can share with colleagues as well. And we welcome you to join the conversation during and after this panel using the hashtag LSI chat on Twitter or Facebook. So with that taken care of, let's welcome our presenters, Drs. Carbaugh and Marzano. Thanks to you both, and the floor is now yours. Thank you, Jeff. This is Beverly Carbaugh. I am uh, happy to be with you today from sunny Tampa, Florida. I currently work at uh, the Marzano Center down in Palm Beach, Florida, where I'm the vice president and senior fellow. Along with me today, I am happy to introduce the Executive Director of Learning Sciences Marzano Center, my colleague, the esteemed Dr. Robert Marzano. Bob, talk to us and tell us where you're coming from today. Well, thanks for the nice inter inter uh, introduction, Beverly. Uh, my name is Bob Marzano. I'm coming to you from Denver, Colorado, which is uh, certainly not not as warm as uh, Tampa, Florida. Um, very excited to be here. Uh, the uh, first, I'm going to let me apologize up front. I caught that flu that's going around, and I'm on the mend, but occasionally start coughing and have a hard time stopping. So if that happens, I will mute my phone. But so if, if I suddenly go away, just hang in there. I'll be back, and I apologize for the uh, sniffling and coughing that might occur. Beverly, why don't we start? Oh, well, let's get started, but we're glad you're able to join us. So let's talk about, there is a lot going on out there in the world of evaluation, especially as it relates to the Marzano frameworks. And we've had a busy year and we've been doing and working to do a lot of updating to the Marzano evaluation models. Uh, Bob, talk to us about why we have invested time, effort to provide updates out in the field for the models. Uh, well, the uh, you know evaluation uh, is always uh, a changing uh, process uh, as we as a profession learn more and more about what is effective evaluation, but then also what works within the current system. Um, the um, uh, we're, we're not unique, but uh, there's not a whole other there, there's not a great many other uh, systems that have all three parts to evaluation uh, in which we would. Uh, describe as, you know, how do you evaluate classroom teachers, how do you evaluate school leaders, and how, you, how do you evaluate dis district leaders. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the part I mentioned about uh, change, that just naturally happens. I mean, you always have to update, you know, uh, what, you, what you're doing based on what you know. Uh, in my experience, uh, about every five years, no matter what the endeavor in education, we learn enough to make slight changes, slight tweaks. You know, in whatever we're doing, and sometimes they're they're very small, but you know, and I think that should be done. Uh, the uh, some sometimes big changes are made though, and that is not necessarily a function of the ch knowing more about the content. It's knowing more about the application of what you're trying to do, and I think that's the case with the evaluation process at the teacher, lead, uh, school leader, and district uh, leader levels, uh, and more more specifically with race to the top. Uh, there was a great emphasis on evaluation at all levels, at least the school leader and teacher levels. Um, and there was great enthusiasm for it and also an assumption that people in education were going to have resources to spend more time and energy on evaluation. And what we found is that's not the case, that there is no more time that K-12, busy K-12 educators have. 
And so many of the models designed within the, uh, the kind of the uh, framework or you know, the hue of race to the top uh, had a lot of pieces and parts, again, under the assumption that a lot of time was going to be spent uh, or available. That, that's not, that, that didn't come true. So what's important now is to live in the new reality of the time we had, you know, uh, is always going to be just very relatively sparse. And therefore, the evaluation models have to reflect that and be as efficient and accurate as possible, you know, and fit within the time and energy constraints uh, that, uh, that uh, affect uh, all teachers. So the, the big changes in our model, you know, are probably more a function of that. Although people familiar with our models, you'll see that, um, you know, there have been content changes and the content changes uh, are more a function of what we've learned as a profession, you know, uh, and, uh, but, but, but the bigger structural changes are just, they're, they're, they're pragmatic changes. Everybody want to add to that? I do. I, w I also want to talk about that in this webinar today, we're really not going to focus on uh, probably explaining the teacher evaluation model because we've had several webinars with the focus teacher eval. What we're going to do is actually show how that we've updated other models to really align with that focus teacher evaluation. And I think there's something exciting too that uh, comes into play in these updates. We actually, uh, at the Marzano Center, collect research on leader evaluation and teacher evaluation, and we have used that, that research to help drive many of these changes. In addition, the standards that uh, teachers have uh, to use when they're teaching, the standards for uh, leaders have been changed and updated in the last year or so. So all of these updates really do align with the new standards that are being used na nationwide. You know, Bob, as we think about evaluation systems, and evaluation systems are, they're a big to-do in a district. Anytime you make a change in how we evaluate teachers or leaders, we really have to know, you know, why we're doing that, how they can be used. Can you talk to us a little bit about how these frameworks can help us align and focus the work we do in a district? Uh, well, yes, I mean, that's the reason we have three uh, three models is because basic assumption we have is that uh, evaluation across the levels, district, school, and teacher, uh, should inform one another and actually help one another. You know, that the, uh, uh, starting from the top, uh, I, the, the, the how district leaders are evaluated should be based on the actions they engage in that inform the level below them, which would be school administrators, and help the level below them. Uh, so evaluation should be a process. It's a feedback system to people to help them be get better, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and 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 provides very accurate and actionable uh, uh, feed, feedback to uh, the level level below. Uh, the um, uh, the the oh shoot, sorry, <laughs> I've got one of those. You got to continue here, Beth. <laughs> Give me a okay, I will. Sorry. I will let, we'll let Bob uh, get a little drink of water there. But one of the things that, as we are have been looking at these updates, that we constantly keep in our discussions is how can we use systems like evaluation systems to really help us align our work within a district. And one of the things that for the last, and I've been working with Bob on evaluation for almost seven years, that I've really grown to appreciate is the framework approach that actually says we provide you a frame that you can use to measure every action that you're taking in your district. So if you look at the slide that's currently on this, uh, up on the screen, and you see those arrows that are going everywhere, if we were to take all of those arrows and we would put all the initiatives happening in a district, many times we feel like we're going in so many different directions and sometimes, you know, I've heard it said the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. But when you actually implement aligned frameworks, you can use those aligned frameworks to help you make every decision. Do they where do they fit in the framework? How do they fit within the framework? 
so that really all of your initiatives should start moving in the same direction and you should be able to actually place everything you're doing within a district within this framework type system. So Bob, if you've caught your breath, did you want to add? I'm back that? again. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should just say what what Bev said. I agree 100%. I do like <laughs> this. I do like this uh, this graphic because it's very illustrative. And what actually happens? You know, on the left side, uh, the I mean, that's that's not intended to be humorous because I think it's true. If you look at all the initiatives that are going on in districts and about the evaluation initiatives being only part of all everything that's going on, that's the picture you get. They're all kind of well intended, but sometimes they crash into each other. The one on the right is the ideal situation. Everything you do, you know, your evaluation systems and your, you know, your curriculum systems, your classroom assessment systems should all be going in the same direction. And actually, your evaluation models, if done with this notion of alignment in mind, can help accomplish that the picture you see on the right side. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I hope you see that when we uh, review uh, the three models for you. Let's move on. Abs yep, Jeff, let's head to the next slide. So let's talk about when we say and use that word hierarchical or aligned systems of evaluation, what in the world are we talking about? Because Bob, here's the question that I get out in the field all the time. Oh, so if it's hierarchical, is it a top-down system? Why don't you talk to us about what it really means to be a, a system of hierarchy? Well, it is a top-down system in terms of information flow. That's the whole, whole idea. That, that top-down gets used negatively uh, when, and it, I think it is negative, when it means, well, decisions are made from the top and everybody else just carries them out and there's no input from the bottom. And that's not what this means at all. Uh, you know, evaluation is a feedback mechanism. It's about information. Uh, and the, the what, what, you know, the feedback to the leaders at the top, you know, should inform the feedback they give to administrators, school, you know, same thing down at the teacher level. And there's, a, and within the evaluation models, there's always uh, the flow going the other way. Uh, so it's not a negative term, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's designed to focus on, you know, measurement, uh, at least one of it, what, what, you know, what one of its functions is, but it's also designed to focus on development, you know, of all constituents, at all, all levels. Um, uh, I like that last question. Do districts currently use the line and systems? Bev, you're, you're the expert in the field. What do you think about that? In general, do you see districts using aligned systems? That is, their, their district administrator system, evaluation system is aligned with the school administrator, is aligned with the teacher, a teacher system. Well, you know, Bob, you may have the answer to this, but I do think we are one of the only systems that currently provide uh, three or four aligned systems because we also have the non-classroom for that very unique group of people that uh, basically uses the same structure. And as I'm out in the field all over the country, I do not encounter many districts that are that are not Marzano that use totally aligned systems. And here's what I'm seeing every year. As evaluation becomes more and more transparent and as people are starting to understand how to use eva uh, evaluation systems as, as growth systems, uh, teachers are saying, well, how are my school leader, how, how are they being evaluated? And I'm seeing more and more of that. And I am pleased to say that, yes, we are starting to see a lot of growth. And that's one of the reasons that we went ahead and uh, you and I have talked about the need to keep the language current and to keep uh, evaluation not becoming uh, static, but to keep it moving, that we invested time and effort into really drilling down into the school and district leader because we're seeing more and more implementation of both of those models in districts where we've been the uh, teacher evaluation model for many years. And I really think that's a, a tribute to what we'll get deeper into here is how districts are seeing uh, what we showed in that last slide, the alignment, but there's something very powerful in what we call a common language and when you start implementing these aligned systems, everybody starts talking the same language, not just for evaluation, but the same language for growth. How do we get better? So 
And Bob, you keyed in on that third bullet about how hierarchical should be a responsive system. And I think that sometimes that people think that when we say hierarchical, it is going to be top down only, but it's not. It's a very responsive system so that the top can respond to every other layer. And we'll show that more. We have some graphics later in this presentation that'll get a little more deeply into that. So Jeff, let's look at this next slide because this kind of sums that up a little bit. Uh, it talks about for a teacher evaluation system to work well, it should be designed and it should work as part of an integrated system. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that, Bob, about an integrated system and why we would say it works better if it all is integrated? Well, yeah. The, um, uh, if if my if I'm a leader at the district level and I'm evaluated on the extent to which um, uh, I provide feedback to my school administrators that actually uh, helps them correct areas where they need correction or help, uh, helps shore up their weaknesses and produces results in terms of change of behavior uh, and acknowledging. Uh, you know, good efforts on their part. Uh, that's going to help the whole system. I mean, I'm not detached now. I, I'm the district leader. I'm not detached because uh, I'm not just passing judgment on the tier below me. Uh, I'm going to be judged on the, in the extent to which I, you know, my feedback to them actually helps them do their job better and so on down the line. Same thing. If I'm a school administrator, I'm evaluating teachers. Uh, I am, in fact, evaluated on whether or not my interactions with them, again, acknowledge what they do well, uh, help identify areas where they need to improve and, and help them do that. So it's really the lever that makes the whole system work when you have a tiered system. And that's what we have. You know, we have district leaders and then we have schools within that. We have teachers, with, teachers within that. And so for just kind of from a logical perspective, they have to be aligned uh, to make the system as efficient and effective as possible. Absolutely. Look at the next slide with us, Jeff, because it really just summarizes what Dr. Marzano uh, described. This system is designed so that the district leader evaluation supports school leaders in the execution of what they do. The school leader is all about supporting teachers in the execution of what they do. And so if you put it all together, well, teachers obviously have the most direct influence on uh, students, but if you put it all together collectively, working in that same uh, direction, uh, everybody focused on achievement of students, I think we're going to see uh, a lot of growth, not just within teachers, but within school leaders and district leaders because it's a responsive system. Jeff, let's look at the next slide because this is, I want Bob to talk to us a little bit about some of the defining characteristics. And this is uh, one of Bob's favorite words, the cascading domain, domains of influence, which we've been talking about, but let's talk about how they really do cascade and multiply. Well, when you look at the, yeah, I do like that word. I don't know why. Uh, the, uh, and I think we're the only one who, who uses it. I just think it's very visual. I really do. That when mm -hmm. I hear cascading, I think of uh, like a three-tiered waterfall, uh, you know, and the water coming down from the top tier hits on the second, uh, top level hits on the second level, which then tier, uh, cascades down to that, the third level. Uh, and that just made, that, it makes sense to me. So, uh, you know, there's influence from the top, you know, there's feedback, you know, coming up the, 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 the other way. But it is a system. That's the important part. The whole thing is a system. It's not administrators at different levels in their isolated towers or silos, um, you know, not having any influence and not being responsible for uh, the, you know, effects of, of, of the levels. Uh, correlated rubric structure, that's really important. Uh, the, um, as you'll see, you know, our rubrics, uh, the structure is basically the same at all levels. And that's, that's a nice thing to have uh, if you're an administrator. Here's why. You know, and let's say I'm a building administrator and I've got teachers and teachers are saying, boy, you know, this new so the system where we're using, I, boy, I'm getting some low scores and I don't like it. And the administrators can say, well, welcome to the club. You know, we're using kind of the same rubric and I'm getting some low ones too. And by the way, that's 
that should be the characteristic of a of a good system that in areas where you're strong that's aspects that's recognized and celebrated uh but areas where you need improvement that that's you know that's uh, that's pointed out and that's just part of getting better can't have a good feedback system if you know the culture is hey my scores can't be low that's not feedback that's compliance and uh and I, unfortunately, I, and I believe Bev agrees that, that that still goes on a lot. You know, if you have an evaluation system where any low score is considered uh, something bad has happened, you know, and the system is set up so that no one gets low scores on anything, you really haven't got an evaluation uh, system. Uh, common language, that's the content, you know, and you'll see, uh, you know, that we, the domains uh, at each level are, you know, the same language is used there uh, to describe the domains. The influence is different or the behaviors are different. Uh, and, and finally, uh, you're looking for growth and results orientation. You really are. That um, uh, the logic behind all of our models is that uh, it takes a long time to be very good at the teacher level, at the school administrator level, and at the district administrator level. And therefore, there should not be an expectation that you know, you're great at everything, particularly if you're beginning. If I'm a beginning school administrator, by definition, I'm going to have areas that you know, I, I, I need to work on, and that's, and that's just fine. Uh, uh, results means that what I'm being asked to improve on should be very measurable, and I know exactly you know, what it would look like in terms of results. Uh, you know, if I'm getting better in a, in a particular area. Um, can we show, can we, let's look at the next slide there, because I mentioned the cascading domains. Uh, now, see, we don't have a teacher evaluation model, but if you're familiar with it, you'll see a, gr a great deal of overlap there. But uh, if you notice, for the district and the school levels, the domains are obviously related. Bev, why don't you go through these? Okay. Well, we're talking about that common language, which I think is one of the most powerful pieces. If I were still back in a district and I was looking for uh, evaluation models, I would be looking for a model that had this common language throughout. So these cascading domains of influence, if you look at the far left-hand side over there, and we look at this big overarching uh, category of achievement or school improvement, and if you look at the the top row, we're talking about dis the district level uh, system. And in domain one, we're talking about a data-driven focus that's all about supporting student achievement because we know at the district, we exist for one reason, that's to provide support. But if you go down the next level, we look at the school leader uh, evaluation and we're looking at a data-driven focus on school improvement because they actually have to use the data at the school to decide what their goals need to be and what they need to focus on and if we uh, probably if we hit that slide again we'd see arrows coming back up because uh, look at this see we made it to show that the district has to respond to that school. They can't provide support if they don't respond, and that's that wonderful uh, bit of cascading domains of influence. So move over to curriculum and instruction and look at the alignment again at the district level. The district is continually supporting improvement of instruction. They continually support that guaranteed and viable curriculum that Dr. Marzano was probably the first in the field to talk about. But then they support it because the leaders out at the schools have to actually go implement that instruction of that guaranteed and viable curriculum. And they have to continually get teachers better so and, and provide professional development for their teachers and their staff so that we can uh, support curriculum and instruction. <laughs> I want to interject any? Oh, Bob's coughing, so I'll keep on I'm going. Good. No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Want to interject anything about those first two big? No, no, areas? we're good. Okay. And I like the slide having the obviously the arrows both way. Yeah, I, I we thought that was pretty cool too. And then <laughs> we do have a little update. If you're on this call and you're listening and you're currently using the model, when you look at the 
what I'm going to say, the next big area of cooperation and collaboration, you're going to see when we unveil the new maps in a minute, you're going to see some updated language. And this updated language really doesn't, uh, we don't see any big changes in the desired effects, except we've made them a little more comprehensive because as we've evolved in the field and as we've looked at new standards, we realize that those cultures that we establish in our schools, they have to become cultures of, of care and we have to be inclusive of all students. So you'll just see some updated language. It was always there, but the language maybe was not as, what I'm gonna say, update as the newest standards. So you'll see some updated language in domain four in both the leader and district leader and school leader models. Same thing with what used to be the climate domains have just had uh, minor updates to talk about, you know, the climate that you establish in your school really represents your core values. The district core values or the school core values. So there's some language updates in both models that really support the climate of your school. And then if you're looking at these cascading domains of influence in the district model, we always had resource allocation management because most of the money that a school gets does come from, from the district. There are certainly some outside entities that could provide funding, but the majority flows from the district down to the school. And in our uh, our legacy model, there were there was not a whole domain focused on resource management. So this is an update to the model. But guess what? We did not add more elements. There were some, there's some compaction of elements that we'll unveil in just a few minutes. But it really tightened up that alignment even more because, again, districts should be responding to the needs of the school as they allocate their funds, and the school should be working within the confines and uh, the rules and regulations of the, school, of the district as well as meeting the needs of their teachers and students. But look at the bottom of all of that. The focus of every bit of this is all about teachers. These two top levels, everything they do should be to support the teacher, whether it's professional responsibilities, conditions for learning, planning, or instruction. Uh, everyone should be responding to the needs of teachers. And at the top of it all, the most important is all of us are focused on the outcome of improving student achievement. What do you think about this graphic, Dr. Marzano? It's a great graphic. Let's, Doesn't uh, it really? Let's, let's, let's go to the next slide because I want to I want to add the research that puts these together. Okay, thank the, you. Uh, let me explain this uh, the funny uh, slide here. Uh, the uh, Bev alluded to this. You know, this has been built. These three models have been built from three different areas of research, but conducted with the same, by the same person, myself and Bev and other people. Uh, and so at the, at the teacher level, uh, the, you know, the research that went into it started, you know, way back with a book called Classroom Instruction that Works and uh, its variations and, and turned into uh, New art, art and Science of Teaching, New Art and Science of Teaching, and then we translated into the essentials. Uh, so there's been tons of work done on that. Uh, at the uh, school administrator level, uh, uh, the you know my work that related to that you know uh, started with uh, what works in schools, uh, you know meta meta analytic synthesis of the correlates, if you will, uh, and an update of those. Uh, uh, a book called School Leadership That Works uh, at the district level. Uh, the uh, book called District Leadership That Works, and so there, there we've synthesized, you know, uh, quite a bit of research across three different areas. Uh, the now, if you go to our, our website, uh, if you go to the Marzano Center at L LSI website, Learning Sciences International, you know, there are a lot of white papers that will synthesize this or point you to some a lot of books that we've done. Uh, now, let me explain uh, this little graphic here. If you put all of that data together, you can create mathematical models, which say, you know, given the relationships that we know are out there between what district leaders do and what school leaders do and how district uh, behavior influences what the school leader does and what the school leader does influences what the teacher does and what the teacher does influences what the student does. Uh, you can come up with some uh, very, very straightforward uh, general predictions about what would happen if to a student, 
to an individual student in terms of his or her achievement um, uh, under certain conditions. So let me play this out. So you got the district leader, the school leader, the teacher, and the predicted achievement gain for a student at the 50th percentile. Now, let me put some numbers here. Uh, I think there are about 56,000 students in K-12 education in this country, if you count uh, private schools, uh, and public schools. Uh, there's 3.4, 3.5 million teachers uh, teaching those students. I think school leaders are teaching 100, about 110,000 schools, K through 12, so about 110,000 school leaders, depending on how you want to count, you know, 12,000 to 13,000 districts, uh, and uh, therefore, you know, leaders there. Now, for each one of those four areas, if you line the constituents up in terms of how well they're doing, you get a normal distribution in each one. For example, those 56,000 students, if you line them up in terms of how they're doing on mathematics, let's say, you know, that you get a normal, a nor a normal distribution. Same thing with the 3.4, 3.5 million teachers. Uh, same thing with the, you know, uh, 110,000 school leaders, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let me explain what's happening here. Let's take a student this first row, a student's at the 50th percentile in a given subject area. He's doing just fine. Uh, he happens to be in the class of a teacher who's at the 50th percentile in terms, in terms of his, his or her pedagogical skill. That teacher's in a building, you know, where, uh, with a school leader who's at the 50th percentile uh, uh, in terms of his or her uh, strength at leading. And that school is in a district where the district leader is at the 50th percentile. Uh, what would you expect to happen to that student over time, let's say a year, and you get a zero there? That's not bad. What that means is the student uh, would still be at the 50th percentile, hasn't lost anything, hasn't gained anything, though, you know, over a year's period of time. Now, let's change it a little bit. The student starts at the 50th percentile, and the student is with a teacher who's still at the 50th percentile, okay, same teacher, but now that teacher's in a building where the principal is at the 84th percentile in terms of his or her leadership abilities. And that, that school is in a district where the school leader, you know, is at the 84th percentile in terms of his or her leadership abilities. Notice what's happened to the student. So even though the student is with the same teacher uh, ability-wise or competency-wise, the fact that the school leader and the district leader are now actually very good, 84th percentile, they're, you know, you know, one standard deviation up there. You would predict the student's score to go up nine percentile points. Now let's go on the skinny branches. You know, same student in the same teacher's class, but now the principal, uh, uh, the leadership from the principal and the leadership from the district are exceptional, 90th percentile. You'd expect a 17 percentile point increase for the student. Now they're mathematical models, you know, and uh, you know we can we the books on it, the website we can reference you, you know, the the logic behind these actually I can give you, uh, the mathematics behind it. If you look at either the book District Leadership That Works or the book uh, School Leadership That Works, you'll see you know these the, the mathematics behind these. Uh, uh, for me, they, they have intuitive sense too. You know, if I have a strong school leader. In that building that, that the leader's in is in a building where there's a strong dis district leader. I should expect, in general, you know, some increase in expectation for, for, for student achievement. Uh, and that's pretty powerful when you line it up like that. It's all connected it, anyway, and therefore our evaluation and feedback systems to all three levels should be connected too. Now, I you know, enjoyed that. I'm probably the only one. But anyway. No, I love it. I every every time we talk about this and you do the research part, I love it because you know what? Look at the uh, question on the slide. Does leadership matter? Absolutely. And uh, we see it in real life. We see it in these mathematical models. The predictability of it. So now, Jeff, let's look at the next slide because let's look at. Uh, the update to the district leader model. And what you're going to see if you're if you've never used these models before, that and I'll actually ask Jeff to toggle down one more and then go back because what I want people to see is that there's actually six domains. So uh, 
if you'll go back to the other, Jeff, what we're looking at are the first three domains. Do you want to talk about these three domains just real briefly, Bob, and then we'll go down to the, the last three, just to give an overview of the district leader model? Uh, well, the uh, you know, just the title should tell you what's going on. Data-driven focus uh, to support student achievement. You know, so at the district level, you're not looking at the data to pass judgment. You're looking at the data, you know, uh, to come up with behaviors uh, uh, that that help uh, 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 help support student achievement at, at the school level. Uh, continuous uh, support for improvement of instruction. Again, pretty straightforward. Uh, that. You're, again, you're not passing judgment. That's not the idea. That you're doing everything you can as a district leader to support the improvement of instruction. I'm not going to go into the elements with too detailed right. at the time. Yeah. Um, and then continuous support for a guaranteed and viable curriculum. And Bev, you're right. I, I, I think I am the one who coined that term. It was in a book in 2003 mm -hmm. called in School." And it's still an important variable, keeping the curriculum focused um, enough that it's clear. You know what. Uh, students are expected to, expected to understand and be able to do, uh, but also it's lean and manageable enough that teachers have the time to uh, actually address the content um, uh, in the, with the time time resources uh, you know that are available. And I still think this is the one of the biggest problems in K-12 education in this country. We we have guaranteed curriculums uh, right now, but to a great extent they're not viable. It's impossible to do it justice in the time available. Absolutely. Well, let's look down. So those are the first three domains, and this model has not changed that much. Uh, just some update to the language. It still has 21 overall elements, six domains. Walk us through these last three domains real quickly, Bob. I, I'm going to start coughing. You're going to have to. Sorry. OK. Sorry, Jeff. Well, You're domain. You're okay. Domain four, a community of care and, cooperate and collaboration. Really, this reflects the culture of your school. How do we operate our school? Do we uh, exude, I mean, our district, not our school, we're at the district level. Does our district, is it looked up on as a community that cares about kids? And we do a lot of collaboration in our district. Uh, to me, this is one of the most powerful domains and one of uh, one that districts can really use to self-reflect about the services they provide. And then it feeds right over into domain five, which is how does it feel in this district? What are our core values? What climate do we have? And this really goes down to everything from transparency to having trust, making decisions that are in the best interest of each student. Uh, and also be responsive to what's happening within the district. And then the very last uh, part of the district level uh, evaluation model looks at how we allocate our uh, resources from the district level. And like Bob said, we really don't have time today to go into each of those elements. But when you really start digging into our systems and you go deeper, you'll find out that each of these elements really work like a standard. They serve as measures so you can decide, look, am I doing all of this? Am I doing part of this? Is uh, I have pieces missing? So they these uh, models really do provide that framework of which uh, you can self-measure yourself against. So let's go ahead for the sake of time and move on to the Marzano Focus School Leader Model because this model has seen uh, quite a bit of updating and even though it still will look very familiar, but if you've not seen the model before and if you're familiar with any of the national standards out there, you're going to see a very close alignment to the language in the national standards. But we have not moved away from the original research of, you know, what works in schools. And, but it's only been solidified by ongoing research that we conduct at the Marzano Center. So again, we have expanded the school leader model to six domains, but the original model had 23 elements. And even with the adding of that six domain, we've compacted the model, made it more focused. It only has 21 elements. And I have to tell you, Bob, uh, we're pretty excited. The school leader model has been cited 
uh, as one of the only one of only two evidence-based models under the new ESSA ESA that is uh, available nationwide, and it's been written up in multiple. Uh, pieces of literature and there's been some research that is showing that it is aligned with what's happening uh, school leader evaluation the feedback and the rating of principals is aligned with how schools are performing I think that research was done in New Jersey so we're we've been in the field long enough for getting some really positive results and feedback about the model since uh, we do have just a couple of seconds here We'll look at domain four, five, and six. And if you just remember what we saw there in the district leader model, look at how tightly those are aligned now that we've broken them apart. But Jeff, let's move on to the next slide because there is a question that as we start looking at these models and we talk about what do you think is critical to the success of each model? And where do they, I could have said, what do you think is critical to kind of get each of these models started? Well, it all, have, it all centers back in setting the right goals. I like to call that the cornerstone of both of these models. And at the school leader model, it's setting the right goals that we're going to work on within our school, the most critical goals. And at the district, it's setting those goals that are going to support schools, but yet are the most critical goals in a district. So cornerstone to both of these models is goal setting. And then you can take that one step further when you go down to the teacher model, it's the same exact uh, cornerstone. It's the right setting of goals in the planning arena. So goal setting remains very important within, this mo within these models. In our last few minutes that we have on this webinar, Bob, let's talk a little bit about our scales or our rubric structures. Because people that are on this webinar that may not uh, be familiar with our rubric system, so would you give them just a quick walk through this, uh, this structure that we use? Sure. The, um, and we use this at all three levels, uh, district, uh, mm -hmm. school leader, and teacher. Uh, it starts with not using. Uh, and you can get the idea just reading the uh, uh, the words in, uh, in red there. Uh, the school leader does not attempt whatever variable we're talking about here. In this case, it's using appropriate data to develop critical goals focused on improving student achievement at the school. Uh, uh, and that's uh, they're not they're not there's no attempt. It's obvious. Uh, the uh, at the beginning level. Wait, wait, uh, they, Bob, let me interrupt. Bob, may I interject something there? Yeah, please. Okay. And you know what? If we were to if we were able to put on screen the teacher, it would basically say the same thing. The teacher, sure. uh, it's called for, but they don't use it. And if we were to put they up the district it leader, it would say this, the district leader does not. So they're very highly aligned. We just took one out of the school leader because it's kind of sure. uh, in the middle. So and you, it would be the same all the way through. So why don't you go ahead and walk us through the others? Sure. Well, the beginning means now they are making an attempt, uh, but it's not working. Uh, 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 in this case, uh, they don't work. Does uh, is not working. Mean the school uh, the uh, school leader you know uh, starts the starts the task but doesn't complete it. Um, at the teacher level, you know, if you're talking about a specific strategy or set of strategies, uh, uh, it, it would be worded slightly different. The teacher tries the strategies uh, but makes some errors or omissions. Uh, at the developing level, uh, there's no errors being made. There's an you know there's uh, efforts. Uh, the tasks are being executed and they're completed. Uh, and you might say, well, it's great. You know, it's as good as it's going to get. Notice the big red line. You know, you have to cross that big red line if you're going to get, you know, uh, district school, uh, district administrators, school administrators, or teachers uh, to that level where they're actually positively influencing student achievement. Remember that slide we had where if you had a teacher at the 50th percentile and a student at the 50th percentile, uh, that student doesn't gain. It's fine, student stays at the 50th percentile. That's good for that student, but what if I'm a student at the fifth percentile? I stay at that fifth percentile. You know, so, you, so to get movement for those students who need the movement, the teacher you know, has to be work, you know, doing better than just uh, 
uh, not making mistakes. And the school administrator, same thing, and the district administrator, the same thing. So look what happens at the applying level here. Uh, whatever the task is or the activity, the person being evaluated, in this case the school leader, regularly, monitor, regularly monitors the effect of their actions. In this case, they monitor that everyone understands the critical goals for student achievement, and at the innovating level, you know, they're, they, they do that to such an extent that they, they're all constituents, you know, have sufficient, uh, 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 what they're doing affects all constituents, not just the majority, uh, but affects uh, all of them. And as Bev said, that goes uh, uh, all the way through. Now, what will happen is that if you use, you know, any one of these levels, it'll be very common that people who are, you know, competent in their job, they're getting a lot of twos developing. You know, nothing wrong with that. The big red line says, you know, if you, if, if you want to produce results that go beyond what you're getting now, you know, you've got to you know, ratchet it up a little bit. Bev, please add to that. Oh, no, I think that's beautiful. But I tell you, I, I was in the field this week working with the district, and when they saw the close alignment of these rubrics, they were shocked because they're not, to our knowledge, my knowledge, many other systems that everyone uses the same basic rubric, and you can almost interchange the language uh, throughout the rubrics. It's pretty powerful. And the next slide, really, uh, Jeff, if you'll move on down, this is another commonality about the desired effects and the outcomes. Would you talk to us a little bit about desired effect and what that means within the context of these models? Well, the, um, well, I, I could ask it as a question. Uh, if I'm a district leader, you know, and I know there are certain behaviors I should be engaged in, how do I know if those behaviors are working? Uh, uh, those are desired effects. I'm asking, what are the desired effects? Well, we've mentioned, we've mentioned it previously. The things that district leader does should have certain observable things occur in the, in the school, uh, in, in the school leader's activities, and what the school does in general. In general, same thing. The school leader ac action should ha have desired effects, and that should manifest at the teacher level. Uh, so you, you get you get the idea. Now we won't go into the specifics, but for each one of the models, for each one of the elements, what we've done is identified what those desired effects might be. Um, and Bev, correct me if I'm wrong, but people have used those desired effects as kind of a you know uh, a, you know a, a game plan for what they should be doing. You know, it's, instead of just a score on a rubric, now they now have guidance as to well, wait a minute, this is if I'm doing a good job on this particular element, this is what I should see happening, you know, at the in the buildings that I monitor because I'm a district leader, or in the teachers that I monitor for, for because I'm, I'm a school leader. So the model already turns into a development plan, and that's the whole idea. If you go back to our original initial slides, it's that school that evaluation at all levels should be precise, it should be rigorous, but it should also uh, be uh, a tool that can be used to help people get better at all levels. You want to add to that, Bev? I will. There's one little thing that I like to, when I'm out in the field working with people, that I like to talk about. If you are doing the actions in the elements or those descriptor statements, then there should be a desired result. So it's almost an if-then relationship. If I'm doing this as a school leader, then here's what I should expect to happen. If I'm doing this as a district leader, then these are the desired effects that I would want. So if we can start thinking about it as an if-then, it really becomes very logical. And the more logical, I think sometimes the easier it is to understand that it's very, there's a, a relationship between your action and your desired outcome. Maybe so you're gonna have to do this last one. This represents the the last slide? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, let's look at that last slide. Uh, this is just kind of summing it all up. The power of alignment, that if we haven't thought about this before and looked at these systems, and this is where we're hoping after this webinar that people are gonna say, hey, 
uh, we're starting to see this. We'd like to talk more about how you can use alignment for continuous improvement. You go along there, how you can use this aligned system for job embedded professional development, how you can use this alignment to use this five point scoring scale, how you can use these aligned systems to develop common goals. And, you know, We've had this slide around for a lot of years, but as we updated the models, it was really kind of cool to go back and say, wow, now we actually can add this piece and we can change that piece. Because as our systems have become more aligned, they really do correlate very closely with the work we're doing in schools and districts. And, and of course, right down to the classroom level. So for for any districts or any folks that are listening today that are considering uh, moving to an aligned system, uh, this is a slide that will just show you some of those benefits that uh, you can't perhaps get all of this if you have a separate system for teachers for their evaluation, another system for your school leaders, and yet another system for folks down at the district. But aligned systems really do hold us all to the same scoring scale and, and does all of these pieces. It pulls them all together. I think at this point, Dr. Marzano, we're going to turn it over to Jeff and let him do some final uh, little pieces of housekeeping. Jeff, thank you for moderating for us today. Absolutely, guys. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience that we have a few minutes to field. So if you both wouldn't mind just fielding a few of these questions, we've had some great feedback and response. Um, one of the things of interest is, are there any districts today that are using all four models? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, I have right off the top of my head, I can think of multiple districts in Oklahoma. I can think of multiple districts in Florida. I can think of multiple districts in New Jersey. Uh, there are, multiple districts in Michigan, and those are just the ones off of the top of my head. I'm sure there are many more, uh, I, I think, in Minnesota that there are quite a few. So yes, there are many districts that are using our current models. Today is really uh, the first day that we have rolled out these school leader and dis these updated school leader and district leader models. So no one is currently using all of the updated models, but they are certainly using the aligned legacy models. And with that said, uh, I think that after this webinar that folks that are listening, if not today, within the next uh, 24 hours should be able to download these new leader maps and the matching protocols that go with them. So they will be available at marzanocenter.com. Again, that's marzanocenter.com. Definitely. Thank you, Beverly. Uh, another question. Uh, you recently talked about the scales. Uh, what's been the response like about the ease of use with the scales? What do you think, Bob? You've, you uh, used these scales even before I did. What's your feedback about our scales? Uh, the, well, Beverly, you're, you're, you know, you have the ultimate say in this, but uh, the, because you're on the field uh, with, uh, with the, both of the evaluation focuses. Uh, once people get the logic of the scales, uh, mm -hmm. their general impression is it would be hard to go back because as we walk through it, the scales are designed for specificity and for development because uh, at all three levels, uh, if you know you're a two, uh, the, uh, you know then exactly what you have to do to be a three. Um, and uh, some people have said, uh, it, look, if you're using evaluation for compliance, uh, and I'll use the teacher evaluation system, even though we're not talking about it now, and you're in a state that says, well, wait a minute, we have four categories, you know, that we have to classify teachers in. Uh, and they're usually something like, um, uh, uh, effective is the third category, highly effective, uh, needs improvement is, is, is two, and unsatisfactory. So why, why wouldn't you have a scale that only has four values? Well, classification is not the purpose here. <laughs> you know, the purpose here is development, and you need those five levels. They're pretty straightforward. Not using, you know, developing, uh, 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 not using beginning, developing, applying, and, and, and innovating. And it's very easy, you know, to take uh, a scale that has five levels 
and collapse them and, and, and combine the data. So you end up with your four, your four classifications. Uh, so if you're looking at just compliance, the knee-jerk reaction will be, wait a minute, let's use a scale with four things. And let's, for each, uh, uh, everything we're looking at, we're going to classify it as unsatisfactory or it needs improvement or effective or, or, or highly effective. Uh, you're mixing two things here. There, one is just categorization, you know, and the other is development. For development officer, you need those five categories. You really do the five, those five levels. Yeah. Yeah, and then for measurement, they really give you that precise <laughs> language that you can use to get yeah. feedback when you take you move from that growth to the uh, to the measurement aspects of it. So the scales have served us well. Uh, in order to give what I say very specific growth feedback and also to give us very specific measurement feedback. Excellent. So it looks like we're going to have time for about two more questions. I want to get to these. One from Janet. Uh, the question is, has the district leader evaluation process been used by school boards in evaluating superintendents? Oh, absolutely. That's one of my most fun uh, things that I go out and train. I don't get as many opportunities these days because, uh, like Bob, we spend a lot of time writing and studying. But uh, working with school boards to use that district leader model to evaluate their superintendents, you're talking about an aligned system when you actually then move it up to where the superintendent uses it to evaluate their their super, where the school board uses it to evaluate their superintendent. It really is an ironclad alignment. And yes, we do. I tell you what, I think the state of Michigan probably has more school boards that use it than any other state, and we have quite a few. Uh, I think we, uh, and I don't have current numbers, but we used to have several in Oklahoma also that were using it to, uh, to evaluate their school. Their school boards use it to evaluate their superintendents. It's very appropriate for that. Very good. One last question that we have time to get to here from Mr. Phil Burdick. How do we support school board members in the evaluation of district leaders when they aren't educators or evaluators? Well, I'll answer that because I, I've been doing that. It's training. They come to training and uh, we, we can actually simplify and point out the language and make this a very, even for non-educators, a very friendly instrument. And uh, I, I will tell you the feedback from the field, from school boards that have used it, they get it when you go out. But without training, it looks a little overwhelming. But when you go in and you have a couple of hours of training and you sit down and you help them break it apart, see the commonalities, uh, how you unpack one element is the way you unpack the other elements, how you use the scales. So it, it's even for non-educators, it's a very friendly in instrument when you have training on how to use the instrument. Great. Thanks so much, guys. We're going to jump here finally to just a few next steps. Uh, we know some of you have asked, and, and Dr. Carbaugh has mentioned the website, which is marzanocenter.com. Uh, so for more information on any of the models that we've talked about today, please visit that website. And please also, if you're interested in a more unique one-on-one -on -one presentation, uh, be sure to contact us through the website, info at learningsciences.com, email address, uh, and we can talk to you about having a, a, a demonstration about the models. And then also eye observation, which we didn't talk too much about today, but which is a great companion technology tool that works really well with these items. And last, uh, we just wanted to mention that in June, mid-June this summer, uh, when we're all looking to have you know a lot of good vacation time and also take into some great learning, the Building Expertise National Conference, seventh annual, will be in Orlando at Disney's Coronado Springs. And both of our esteemed panelists today, Dr. Carbaugh and Dr. Marzano, will be in attendance, will be presenting. So we certainly welcome you to come to this conference, meet both of the doctors, a lot of other great speakers, a lot of great insights. And for as a special token of our thanks, we want to say that if you are interested in coming to the conference, we can provide this discount code, which is LSI Web, which you use at checkout on the Building Expertise website when you register at buildingexpertise.com. So with that, I want to thank Dr. Carbaugh and Dr. Marzano 
especially Dr. Marzano, thanks for plugging through uh, under the weather today. We really do appreciate that. Okay. And uh, well, I want to thank Bev. I want to thank Bev for saving me there a couple times. Appreciate it, Bev. <laughs> Hey, listen, we make a good team. Thank you. Absolutely. And to everybody else on the line, please stay tuned. We're going to have follow-up emails with a lot of the information, links to the recording of this webinar, as I mentioned, uh, links to the presentation, some of the other materials that were referenced. And we love to stay in touch and let you know and answer as many questions as you, as you have about these excellent models. So thanks again to everybody and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye.